Great. So it's a pleasure to have Steve Simon, uh, professor of theoretical physics at Oxford. You were also the head of theoretical physics in Bell Labs. At the, I was for a while. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That was a long time ago now. Yeah. Yeah. A big expert on topological phase of matter and you will teach us everything he knows. Today. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation to get, give this talk. I was hoping I'd be able to go to Israel to give it, but uh, unfortunately that will have to wait for another time, but I, I do hope to get there uh, sometime soon. So the topic I'm going to talk about, uh, topologically ordered matter and, uh, and why you should care, is a, is a topic that cuts across several fields of, of modern science. Um, in the condensed matter community, I'm a condensed matter physicist by training, uh, topologically ordered matter is one of the uh, prevalent themes of, of modern research. In the uh, quantum information community, a lot of the ideas of topologically ordered matter are um, reincarnated in the language of error correcting code. So it's very important in that field as well. And many of the ideas of topologically ordered matter actually grew out of the high energy field of people thinking about things like quantum gravity way back in the, in the 1980s. But the field is actually much older than that. And it goes back into the 1800s, which is where I'm going to start this story. So in 1867, there were two very well-known physicists up in Scotland. The first one I'm sure everyone knows, a guy by the name of uh, William Thomson, who uh, later became known as Lord Kelvin. Uh, and his, the other person, a very close friend of his and collaborator, also a very good scientist, but less well-known, a guy by the name of Peter Tate. Um, Kelvin and Tate, uh, they collaborated throughout their lives on many interesting things. In 1867, they were interested in a phenomenon actually a fluid flow, which got them started uh, thinking in these directions. And the phenomenon is a phenomenon that everyone uh, was familiar with in the 1800s. It's a phenomenon of a, uh, a smoke ring or a vortex ring. And so I drew a ring here and you're supposed to imagine an invisible ring in the air. And then the smoke or the fluid, the air, circulates around that uh, invisible ring this way, like that. And the whole thing comes out of the plane of the board at you. Now, back in the 1800s uh, in, in Scotland, people used to do this strange thing called smoking tobacco that meant that everyone was uh, familiar with the, the phenomenon of smoke ring because a talented uh, smoker could blow, a, um, could blow a smoke ring from their mouth. People don't uh, smoke tobacco anymore because they discovered it's bad for you, but I'm told it's a little bit like vaping. So anyway, um, the, the thing about giving talks on, on, on Zoom is you have no idea if anyone is laughing at your jokes. So I'll make the probably the wisest assumption and assume that no one is laughing at any of my jokes because they never do. Anyway, so, but seriously, they, they uh -huh. were, um, okay, so someone laughed. Um, so the, um, they, were, they were studying the, the phenomenon of a, of a, a smoke ring and uh, Peter Tate managed to build a machine that would produce smoke rings and he showed it to his friend, Lord Kelvin. And Kelvin was really very, very impressed with it. Um, wow. And he had a number of simultaneous and important epiphanies. The first epiphany is something we still teach in um, undergraduate fluid dynamics courses. And roughly it can be summarized in what later became uh, Kelvin's circulation theorem. Circulation theorem. The content of this theorem um, is basically, or can be basically summarized by the following statement. If it were not for the um, viscosity or the friction or the dissipation in the air as a fluid, um, then this fluid flow configuration, the fact that the fluid is flowing around this invisible ring in this way, this fluid flow configuration would be stable for all time. It would never go away. It would just keep rotating around and around and around and around and the smoke ring would be completely stable. So that got Kelvin uh, thinking, where can you find uh, a fluid with no dissipation at all, no friction, no viscosity? Such fluids do exist. We call them superfluids. Um, at very low temperature, for example, if you cool helium down to just a few degrees Kelvin, it becomes a superfluid. Um, but Kelvin didn't know about superfluids. Uh, they didn't have any cryogenics at the time. And in fact, helium hadn't even been discovered at that time. However, Kelvin thought he knew about something that was a perfect dissipationless fluid. Um, this is a famous mistake in the scientific literature, a very important scientific uh, mistake in the literature. It was a mistake known as ether. Let me remind you what, what ether was. Ether was supposedly a perfect dissipationless, frictionless fluid. And the purpose of this uh, fluid was to carry electromagnetic waves. Now, why is it that they believed in such a, such a thing? Well, they knew a lot about waves and they realized that when 
they saw a wave on the water, what they were actually seeing was uh, water sloshing back and forth. And when they heard a wave of sound in the air, what they were realized what they were listening to was the air actually moving, moving back and forth. Now, they knew that light was a wave. It had wave-like properties. They didn't see anything moving back and forth, but they hypothesized that such a material must exist, and it was called the ether. The idea of the ether goes back several hundred years before Kelvin and Tate, actually all the way to René Descartes. Uh, René Descartes, the famous French philosopher, he said, uh, he just invented it. He, he said, I think, therefore it is, and created uh, ether. In case you didn't catch that, that was a, a joke about philosopher. Anyway, anyway, um, it was invented by, um, by uh, Descartes. And they knew, or the scientific community all believed in, in ether by the 1800s. People like, like Kelvin and Maxwell and everyone who was, uh, who was any sort of scientist all believed in ether because they believed that something had to carry electromagnetic waves. Now they knew that this ether stuff had to be extremely dissipationless because you can see um, light from stars very, very, very far away. And if it were not for, um, uh, and, and if there were any dissipation in the, um, in the ether, you wouldn't be able to see light from stars very far away. So anyway, on the one hand, Kelvin has his uh, circulation theorem, which tells, tells you that in a perfect dissipationless fluid, this sort of fluid flow configuration would, uh, would never end, uh, it would be completely stable. And on the other hand, he believes that uh, the universe is filled with this perfect fluid called ether. So he asked himself, well, what then is this fluid flow configuration, this smoke ring in the ether? And he came to a really remarkable conclusion. His remarkable conclusion was that this smoke ring in the ether is an atom, like hydrogen. And then you could have something more complicated, like two linked rings, this and, and like this, where the fluid flows around this ring this way and this ring this way. And by Kelvin's circulation theorem, um, again, this fluid flow configuration would be completely stable uh, forever, um, as long as the fluid is completely dissipationless. And this might be a more complicated, maybe a molecule like, like H2 or something like that. And you can have something even more complicated See if I can draw this without making a mistake. Um, you can have uh, a sort of a knotted uh, string like this and the fluid flowing around the knotted line this way, this way, this way, and this way. And this could be some even more complicated uh, atom like, like lithium or something like this. Now, this idea known as, as Kelvin's circulation, cell, sorry, Kelvin's vortex theory of, of the atom. It sounds completely nuts to us right now because we know atoms have nothing to do with, well, we know ether doesn't exist at all. And we know at what atoms are made of and it has nothing to do with any sort of uh, fluid flow. Um, but it sounded like a very good idea in 1867. A lot of scientists took it very, very seriously for, for a, a long time. Um, some people criticized it right away. And one of the people who initially criticized it was, was, uh, was Peter Tate. Uh, his criticism was that it uh, is a nice picture, but it um, didn't predict anything useful about, about the atoms, things like their, their chemistry, their electrical properties, their masses, things that you would want a, a theory to actually predict. But after some amount of time, most of the scientific community gave up um, their work on the vortex theory of the atom for exactly the reasons that Peter Tate had mentioned earlier. Um, but by that time, actually, Peter Tate had changed his mind on the vortex theory of the atom. He said, well, you know, it's, um, it may not be predictive, but it's actually very beautiful. And sometimes there is truth where there is beauty. And so what he said to himself is that what he really needed to do was build a periodic table of all the possible knots that you can make with string. This is the simplest knot. This is the next simplest knot. This is the next simplest knot and so forth. And he felt that if he had a periodic table of the knots, he would be able to have uh, some more knowledge about the periodic table of the elements. So he set himself a task to build a periodic table of, of the knots. And this task took him much of the remainder of his scientific career. Um, so Peter Tate became rightly what we now view as the uh, intellectual father of the mathematical field known as knot theory, the study of knots, a very important field of, of, of topology, a very rich field of topology, which has important ramifications for physics, which I'm going to uh, tell you about uh, in, this, in this talk. Um, before leaving uh, the story of Peter Tate, I should tell you how the story 
ends, which is actually a, a rather sad ending. Around 1900, Peter Tate starts getting rather depressed with his efforts to build a periodic table of the knots. While he learned an immense amount about, uh, about knots, and in fact, he, you know, he invented the entire field of knot theory, um, he built this table of the knots and he realized he was no closer to understanding anything at all about the periodic table of the elements. So he writes some, some letters to his friend, Lord Kelvin. Uh -huh. about, hello, is a question? No. Um, so anyway, the, um, uh, he writes some letters to his friend, Lord Kelvin, saying about how, how sad he is that, that his uh, periodic table of knots isn't telling him anything further about the periodic table of the elements. And then the, um, the, the next year, his, his son, Freddie Tate, who actually, if you're a huge, huge golf fanatic, you'll know the, the name Freddie Tate. He was a, a champion of the British Open. Um, but I've yet to find someone who loves golf that much that they actually know the name Freddie Tate. But anyway, he was a, 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 um, a, a great golfer. Actually, Peter, Peter Tate himself was also a great, great golfer um, and a rugby player. He represented uh, Scotland in the national, international rugby tournaments. But um, anyway, so Peter Tate's son, Freddie Tate, was killed in the Boer Wars. That put Peter Tate into a terrible depression, and he dies just a few months later depressed not only that his, uh, his favorite son was, was killed, but also because he felt like he wasted so much of his career on this theory of, of atoms that actually came to nothing. Um, what he didn't realize is that his work on understanding knots was going to be extremely important both for, both for physics and mathematics. So with that as an introduction, let me tell you what it is that Peter Tate realized, which is so important. So Peter Tate put his, his finger on the, the main question in the theory of knots, and it's a very simple question. If I draw two pictures of knots, so here's a very, very, very simple knot, it's just a simple loop of string, uh, sometimes called the unknot for its simplicity, um, and we compare that knot to another picture of a knot, something that looks like this, slightly more complicated. The question is, are these two pictures, are they the same knot or are they different knots? Uh, are they what we call topologically equivalent or topologically inequivalent? In other words, can you take this picture here and deform it without using scissors, somehow untie it and turn it into this picture? Now, we're all pretty smart here and we can probably see in our heads without any work that if you just unfold this here and pull this one under there, this picture on the right will turn exactly into this picture on the left. So we say those two pictures are, are topologically equivalent. Um, uh, but it actually becomes rapidly more difficult when you get more complicated knots to distinguish when two knots can be deformed into each other and when they cannot be deformed into each other without, without cutting. For example, if you take this knot here, known as the right-handed trefoil, um, it was only in the 1920s that someone managed to prove that the right-handed trefoil actually can't be deformed into its mirror image, the left-handed trefoil. Uh, that's an exercise you might want to might want to try. And with more complicated knots, it becomes more and more difficult to tell uh, when they're the same and when they're different. So what Peter Tate realized is that you need some mathematical tools to help you distinguish knots from each other. Um, and the tool in in modern nomenclature that Peter Tate never used this this language, but in nom modern nomenclature, uh, the tool we use is what's known as a knot invariant. Now a knot invariant is a mapping from an input, which is a picture of a knot or, or a knot or a picture of a knot to an output uh, via a set of rules. Um, the output can be a, a number, it could be uh, some variable or polynomial, it could be a color or something like that. Any sort of output is, a, is actually okay. The important thing is the, the set of rules must be cooked up in such a way that topologically equivalent knots have to give you the same output, okay? Topologically equivalent knots have to give you the same output. Two things that can be deformed into each other without cutting give you the same output. So if you have two really complicated knots and you don't know if they're equivalent or inequivalent, you put them into the set of rules. If you get two different outputs, then you know immediately that these knots can't be deformed into each other without cutting. These are two different entries on Peter Tate's periodic table, the knots, okay? So you can imagine how it is that uh, having knowing about knot invariants is going to be something that's extremely useful if you're trying to build a periodic 
table of the knots. To show you how knot invariants work, I'm going to define a knot invariant, which is a particularly simple one. It's also a particularly useful one for physics. It is not a knot invariant that Peter Tate knew about. It's one that came along much later. It's known as uh, the Kaufman bracket invariant, Kaufman uh, bracket. Kaufman gets a number of things named after him. Um, and the Kaufman invariant is named after its inventor, who is actually Vaughn Jones. So that was a little joke. It was not named after its inventor. It was actually invented by Vaughn Jones. Vaughn Jones is a, um, uh, a very famous mathematician who passed away last month. Um, he, uh, he won a Fields Medal, highest prize in mathematics, for his work in the theory of knots. Kaufman, Lewis Kaufman, is another mathematician, um, still alive, uh, doing very well. Um, he did not win a Fields Medal. But what he did, I think, is at least as important as what Jones did. He managed to take what Von Jones was doing and simplify it so much that I can explain it to you in just a few minutes, which is what I'm going to do now. So to define the Kaufman bracket invariant, um, the first thing we need to do is we need to pick a number. We'll call it A. A stands for a number. That's why I call it, would call it A. Um, for now, we'll leave it as a variable, um, but later on, we might give it a uh, actual particular value. Then there's only two rules that we have to remember. The first rule is that if you have a loop with nothing going through it, you can replace that loop with the following quantity, minus a squared minus a to the minus two. Okay, and, and this quantity comes up so often, we give it its own name, we call it d. So a loop is worth d. So you can take a loop and you can replace it with the number d. Um, now, the second rule is more complicated. The second rule goes like this. If you have a picture of a knot and there are two strings crossing over each other this way, we can replace that picture by a sum of two pictures. One picture, the first picture, the two strings are going vertically. And the second picture, the two strings are going horizontally. And the pictures get prefactors of A and A inverse. Okay, so what am I doing here? What I'm doing here is I'm doing some sort of algebra with pictures. I take a picture of a knot and I replace that picture with a sum of two pictures of a knot and the sum and the and the, these pictures get algebraic prefactors. Okay. If this isn't clear, I'm going to do an example of this in a moment to hopefully make it more clear. Those are the only two rules we need, but I'm going to define another rule, which you'll see is exactly the same as the second rule. It's just I'm going to rotate all the pictures by 90 degrees. And the reason I'm doing this is because it's actually a lot easier to draw the rule twice than it is to ask you to rotate your head at, at a later point in the talk, okay? Okay, so I'm gonna now do an example of evaluating the Kaufman invariant um, of a, a very simple knot. So let's take this, the simple knot that we looked at earlier, this one, like that. And we would like to um, calculate this Kaufman invariant. So how do we do it? Well, we look at this knot and we see within this little dotted loop, there's a crossing and that crossing looks exactly like this crossing. So we can replace that crossing with A times, horizontal, times vertical plus A inverse times horizontal. And then everything outside of the yellow loop just gets transferred over to the right unchanged like this, okay? outside the loop, it looks exactly over on the same the right, unchanged. Okay, is it, is it clear what I've done? Are there any questions about that? Because if you understand this, you'll understand pretty much everything that's going on in this talk. Everyone happy? I'm happy. Okay, good. I like to make people happy. Okay, so now, th now I have, have these pictures, I have some of two pictures, and these pictures also still have crossings in them here. So um, I can remove those crossings by applying the lower rule. So let me do that rather quickly. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this A, move it down here and open up a bracket. And then this crossing here is, makes me take uh, A times horizontal, applying the, the lower rule here, A times horizontal plus A inverse times vertical. And then everything gets uh, that wasn't inside uh, say this blue loop here, not in this blue loop, uh, gets transferred down here unchanged. Like this, like this. OK, 
Okay, and then I do the same thing over here. I bring down this A inverse plus A inverse. Um, and then I have A times uh, horizontal plus A inverse times vertical. And then everything um, gets um, transferred over unchanged. Okay, now at this point, all I have left is, is simple loops and uh, no crossings left and each loop gets the value D. So we can just turn everything into algebra now. So from the first term, I have A squared. There's two loops in this first term. So I get D squared. Um, the A cancels here. The A here cancels this A inverse. There's one loop in that second term. So I get D. Uh, and the third term, A cancels A inverse again. And I have three loops, so that's D cubed. And the fourth term, I have A to the minus two. Two loops is D squared, okay? Um, I then have one more thing. Oops, so everyone, everyone happy with this? Still happy? One more thing is a little bit of algebra. So I'm gonna steal this equation up here. Um, copy and paste it down here. I'm gonna use this, paste. Um, that you'll notice that D is minus A squared minus A to the minus two. So I can group the first term here and this last term here and get, give me a, a, a minus D times D squared. So these two terms come together to give me uh, minus D cubed. This minus D cubed cancels this D cubed. And at the end of the day, what I get is just D. Yay. Okay, that's the end of the calculation. Okay. So why is that calculation so exciting? Why does it get, why does it get labeled with yay? It's so exciting. Well, we started with this picture here of this sort of funny figure eight-ish looking, looking knot. Secretly, we knew that this was just a loop, okay? We kind of tried to fold it over to make it look more complicated, but it was just a loop. And the value of a loop is D. So this thing is supposed to give me is supposed to give me D. Now we tried to make it look more complicated by folding it over, but at the end of the day, when we calculate uh, everything, uh, at the end of the day, the Kaufman invariant still comes out D. Now we could have taken the Kaufman invariant, uh, we could have taken this knot, we could have folded it over a hundred times, twisted it up, tried to make it look really, really super complicated. We still would have gotten D at the end of the day, okay? That's how Kaufman, uh, how, how knot invariants work in general. It doesn't matter how complicated you try to make the knot look, it will still give you the same result if it can be deformed without, without cutting, okay? Um, so you can see why it is that this might be a useful thing to have at your disposal if you're trying to build a periodic table of knots. Now, if you think just a little bit longer, you will realize that maybe it's not as useful as it seems. Why? Well, in this picture here, we had two crossings um, and I ended up with four diagrams, one, two, three, four. If I had had Three crossings, I would have had eight diagrams. Four crossings would have given me 16 diagrams. Five crossings would have given me 32 diagrams. In general, the number of diagrams um, is uh, two to the number of crossings. And the problem is that it's really, really super easy to draw a picture of a knot which has 100 crossings. But the number two to the 100th is so big that even if you ask the world's largest computer to try to calculate the Kaufman invariant, of, of this knot with a hundred crossings, you know, it would never be able to do so even in a thousand years, okay? So the problem is that exponentials are, are very bad and exponentials always end in great sadness and misery some way as we're all discovering from the coronavirus crisis these days. Anyway, so the sadness that occurs, very good. yeah, whatever that's worth, yeah. the. Uh, for whatever it's, it's worth, the problem with, with using the Kaufman invariant to distinguish complicated knots from each other is that they're, they become exponentially hard to evaluate. And we'll come back to that issue in a moment. Okay, so what does this all have to do with physics? Uh, it's a nice little bit of knot theory, but it doesn't sound like it's physics. So I'm gonna define something else here in a moment. Um, and it's gonna seem like it's very different, but you'll see that it's in fact exactly the same. So what I'm going to define is the idea of a topological quantum field theory. Quantum field theory. Um, and um, I can define this, there's several ways to define it, but let me define it in the following way. This is a quantum system 
where amplitudes depend on topology, amplitudes depend on topology, not on geometry. It's an important statement. Um, and I'll try to explain a little bit more what I mean by this, but let me back before defining uh, this in, in more detail and giving examples, let me um, uh, define one of the words that was in the title of my talk, topologically ordered matter is basically the same thing, logically ordered matter. And the difference between the topological quantum field theory and topologically ordered matter is a topological quantum field theory is, an, is a mathematical thing that you write on paper that describes your topologically ordered matter, which is something that lives in your laboratory. Okay, so there's a slight subtle distinction between them that people often uh, brush over. Um, okay, so what do I mean by this definition of these things? A quantum system where amplitudes depend on topology, not on geometry. So let me, let me try to draw some pictures. Um, so all the pictures I'm going to draw today are going to be of two-dimensional systems. So here's a two-dimensional system, a, a disk, for example, and time is going to run vertically. So I can draw a straight line running vertically. Uh, time always goes up in my pictures because, because time is money and money hopefully goes up. All right, forever. <laughs> See, this is this is one of these cases where I'm certain no one's laughing at it. Okay. Anyway, so um, time is going to go up in these pictures. So I start with my two-dimensional system, a disk here. Let's assume this disk starts in its ground state. It's some physical system. It's in its ground state. Let's assume it's a gapped ground state. There's no low energy excitations running around. Nothing like that. It's just completely boring system sitting in its in its ground state. I can choose at some point to add some energy to the system, maybe by sending in a photon. And that photon can create, say, a particle-antiparticle pair or particle-hole pair. If you're a condensed matter physicist, you call it a particle-hole. And then maybe I'll, I'll choose to add some energy over here. Again, maybe sending in a photon to make a particle-hole pair. And then I'll maybe drag one particle around another particle like this, and then bring them back together at some later times here. And here. Okay. Now, at the end of this, uh, get rid of that line so I have a little more space. Um, at the end of this experiment, um, we ask what happens when these particles come back together here and here? Well, several things can happen. One thing that can happen is that the particles can uh, re annihilate and emit their energy back uh, exactly this, the way that they came in, maybe emitting it as, as photons. But that doesn't have to happen. That's one possibility. It's not the only possibility. Another thing that can happen is these particles can form bound states that uh, refuse to annihilate. They won't go back to the vacuum. They, they just sit there and they do not go back to the vacuum. Um, and there's some probability amplitude of either of those things happening. So it's a question as to what comes out. Now, it shouldn't bother us that we have a probabilistic outcome because this is very typical of quantum mechanics that you have a probability amplitude of one thing happening and a probability amplitude of another thing happening. And you have to repeat the experiment many times to see what the probability of one thing and what the probability of the other thing is, okay? Now, and to, to get from the probability amplitude to the probability, you, you square, you square the, you take the absolute value of the square to get the, the probability from the amplitude. Now, my statement up here was that on my topological quantum field theory or my topological order matter is a quantum system where amplitudes depend on topology, not on geometry. What that means is the outcome of this experiment, the probability of, of either the particles re-annihilating and going back to the vacuum or the particles not re-annihilating form bound state is the same if I change the geometry of this picture, maybe make it look like this, but I don't change the topology. In other words, I don't change the fact that this picture I drew is fundamentally two rings that are linked with each other. I mean, I can make it look a little bit different. I can make, you know, this go further over here like that. I can maybe stretch this over here. And the outcome of this experiment is going to remain uh, the same. I mean, maybe I'll uh, create this a little bit later up here, maybe make this a little bit shorter like that. Um, and again, the outcome of the experiment remains the same. The point is 
that the outcome of the experiment, the amplitudes, depend only on the topology of the picture, the, the knot that I drew, and not on the detailed geometry. Now, this should strike us as a little bit surprising um, because we're used to the idea that in quantum mechanics, details matter. Things matter, like how close particles got to each other, how fast they were moving, uh, how long they lived before I tried to re-annihilate re them. All those sort of things see, can matter in quantum mechanics in general. But the statement is, if you have a topological quantum field theory, if you, or if you have topologically ordered matter, these things do not matter. The only thing that matters is the topology of, of, the, of the knot uh, in the picture that you've drawn, drawn in a space-time diagram. Is everyone happy with that idea? Okay, no complaints. Um, now this connection, um, well, okay. So you'll notice um, that what I'm telling you here in a different language is that these amplitudes uh, are actually themselves not invariants. So not invariant, why? Um, because it's some sort of mapping from an input. The input is the picture of this knot, the space-time diagram to an output, which is some probability amplitudes. And the output only depends on the topology of the knot. If two knots are topologically equivalent, they have to give the same, the same output. Therefore, the amplitudes themselves are in fact not invariants. And this um, connection was very famously made by Ed Witten uh, in 1989 in a uh, rather landmark paper that opened up quite a few fields of, of both mathematics and, and physics. Um, Ed Witten incidentally won the Fields Medal along with Von Jones for his work on, on, on knot theory. And um, so Witten did a number of important things in, in this paper of which I will not mention most of this, them, but one of the important things that he did is he made a connection between certain known topological quantum fields I can't hear, I can't hear you. I can't either. Some sort of technical problem. Let's see when we're getting back. Just a second. Can you hear me? We can hear you. I can hear you, but I can't hear Steve. Yeah, I think he dropped out of the call. <laughs> we didn't laugh at the jokes. Yeah. Our fault. Um, let, let's just hold. But we on. should send him a chat or something. Oh, dear. oh he, yeah. we can. Yeah. Um, oh, are, are, okay. am I back? Am I back again? Yeah. Yes, yes, you're back yes, again. You're back. I, I, the, something happened and, and I was cut off for a second. But okay. So um, sorry about that. Um, can't be can't be lucky all the time that your internet stays alive all the time. Um, so Chern Simon's theory. It's a, it's a gauge theory, so you need a gauge group. If you choose the gauge group SU2, you need a coupling constant. The coupling constant is usually written here as a subscript. It has to be an integer for reasons of consistency, which I won't go into. Integer. Uh, um, so um, what Witten did is, is he discovered that um, if you're thinking about chern simons theory as SU2 level K, and you want to know the amplitude of all the pop, uh, the amplitude of for all the particles reannihilating to the vacuum. So the probability of reannihilation up to a normalization, which I won't discuss, this is exactly equal to the Kaufman invariant, Kaufman invariant squared of the particular knot. So you have to choose, now there's not quite the amount of information, you need one more piece of information. You need to know what number A do you plug into the Kaufman invariant. The number A that you plug in is you use A equals I e to the I pi over 2k plus 2. So if you have some knot like this one and you want to know what's the probability of all your particles reannihilating back to the vacuum, the probability amplitude of that is exactly the Kaufman invariant of the knot using this value of, of A. Um, okay. Now, the reason I've, I've mentioned this for SU2 level K is, is because these are some of the, the simplest cases and they, and they correspond to the Kaufman invariant, but they also 
correspond to some real physical systems. Uh, so real systems. Uh, now, uh, this tells well, the fact that it corresponds to real physical systems um, is tells us that that uh, these topological quantum field theories are not just uh, figments of of Ed Witten's overactive imagination, but they're actually uh, real physical things. So let me just make a a, a list of uh, SU two. Well, SU two level one is the simplest case. That's uh, similar to U one level n. Uh, abelian gauge theory. So most fractional quantum Hall effect fits in that category. SU2 level two, um, there's everything that people, where people call Majorana systems, um, Majorana systems. Most of those are very closely related to SU2 level two. There's some examples of these. There's nu equals five halves fractional quantum Hall effect. There's um, uh, helium, 3A, so helium-3, that's, uh, you know, the helium with three nucleons instead of four. A is a particular, you cool it down to some very low temperature, it becomes a superfluid. A is one of the phases of that superfluid, but it's a helium-3A film because we're thinking about this in two-dimensional two uh, systems. There's a number of materials that people are excited about these days, which they believe are in the SU2 level two class, uranium uh, telluride, there's iron, tellurium uh, 0.55, selenium 0.45. Both of these, when they become superconducting, we believe it's in this SU2-2 class as well. And then there's SU2-3 class, and there's only one of those. There's fractional quantum Hall effect at filling fraction nu equals 12 fifths. Um, and there are a few others that, that I haven't mentioned, but, but, but this is sort of um, a list of the most prominent, the prominent examples of uh, topological quantum field theories or topologically ordered matter. Okay, um, so I've about 20 minutes left. Uh, let me, um, is it typical that, that, I, that I run over time a little bit or no? Yes. Yes, Fine. okay. So in that case, I'll, I'll, I'll do a little bit of truth in advertising. Truth in advertising. Uh, question, Steve. Yes. Uh, does it have to be in two dimensions, the field theory? Uh, no, there's, uh, there are topological quantum field theories in, in higher dimensions as well. Um, uh, unfortunately, the you can't have knots in, and you can't have knots of point particles in higher dimensions. So topological quantum field theories in higher dimensions are more complicated beasts. Um, so you can have objects which are um, uh, ring-like, for example, ring-like sort of quasi-particle excitations, and you can you know, take a um, like you can take a smoke rings through smoke. You have know, a smoke ring in three dimensions and and ask about what happens as you move one smoke ring through another smoke ring or something like that. Um, there are topological quantum field theories in higher dimensions and, and many, many such, but I, I focusing on uh, two plus one dimensions because you have interesting braiding properties of single particles. Uh, in three dimensions, you can have interesting braiding par particle properties of a particle going through a loop, but not a particle around a particle. Okay. Is that, is that clear? Or is that not a clear statement? Yeah, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay. Uh, so truth in advertising. Um, so um, let me try to ex explain. So there's a little bit of a hitch here in um, uh, what I told you about the Kaufman invariant. And to, to try to explain what this hitch is, I'm, I'm going to uh, do an example of calculating the Kaufman invariant of a little piece of a knot here. So uh, here I'm drawing just a piece of the knot. I assume the rest of it you know, meets up with itself somewhere. I'm just not interested in what's going on over there. Let's try to evaluate the Kaufman invariant of this little, little piece of the knot. So to do that, um, let's, okay, so what I, I need to do is I need to use, um, oh, actually, you know what? I think I've hidden these rules somewhere. I'm going back here. I hid the rules over here. Yes, there I did. Oh, I was so well planned. Okay, so I'm going to use uh, this crossing rule here. Um, so I need to take this and make it uh, A times, uh-oh, ah, I just lost my- um, Lost your screen. Lost the screen, let me, let me log back into the screen. Oh boy, the, I've, I've given a number of, of, of talks over Zoom before and I, I haven't lost any of them. So hold on. Um, just proves you are human, that's all. Yeah. Right, well, probably the, the Israeli intelligence. Yeah, 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 they're, 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 they're spying on me, right? 
Um, is it is it broadcasting now? Uh, no. Or no? No. Okay. No, no. Let me try again. Somehow. Um, okay, well, I have to maybe kill this first. Um, yeah, it's uh, yeah. I think I think try again. Okay. Oh boy. Are there any questions anyone wants to ask while we're while we're doing this? Um, well, I... you say you wanted to ask something. Uh, so, how is it known that all these systems, physical systems, that yeah. you mentioned, uh, can be described by these? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's that's a very good that's a very good question. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so it, it isn't noted. It's it's known to, due to circumstantial evidence. I think the the evidence is strongest in the case of fractional quantum Hall effect. So in let me back up here. So I listed um, that all of uh, the sort of conventional fractional quantum Hall effects are similar to SU two level one, that meaning they have abelian statistics. So you know back in the early days of fractional quantum Hall effect, everyone. Um, you know, it was, it was predicted that the quasi-particle excitations of fractional quantum Hall effect have uh, braiding statistics, that they're, they're anions with fractional braiding statistics. For the first time, that was just proven this year, experimentally. Um, so, and that took, you know, 35 years, more or less, to do. Um, so the evidence for these cases is, is less good still. Um, but there's saw a lot of circumstantial evidence which make us really believe very strongly that at least, you know, at least in the fractional quantum Hall case, actually in the helium three case as well, that's very, very well established uh, to the circumstantial evidence, what phase of matter we're looking at. And then theoretical arguments tell you what the, um, uh, what the physics is of that uh, phase of matter. Okay. What about the SU3 level three? Sorry for exposing my ignorance. Is there any, any um, experimental data on that? Um, so on SU2, on this one here? Yeah. No, the only thing that we have there is that we know that there's a quantum Hall plateau and a lot of um, numerical evidence indicating that, that the nature of that, that quantum Hall plateau fits in this class. So, so there's no exper real experimental ev evidence telling us that, uh, that what we're seeing there is, is of this exotic variety, but there's, there's good numerical evidence of it. Okay. okay. All right, so um, let me just write out that, that, that rule here again. So it's, it's A times vertical plus A inverse times horizontal. And then we need to, um, you know, this all extends to the, to the left and this goes over here. This uh, extends to the left, this goes like this. And then this loop here is worth D. This uh, string gets straightened out so it looks like this. So we get a total of a times D plus A inverse times a straight line that goes off to the left like this. Um, and just a little bit of algebra will tell you that AD plus A inverse is actually minus A cubed times a straight line going off to the left. And now everyone should be very upset with me, um, which is why I'm doing truth in advertising here, um, that I told you that if two knots could be deformed into each other without cutting, they should give you the same Kaufman invariant. And here I'm telling you that in fact, this and this have a different Kaufman invariant by a factor of minus a cubed. So that's a problem. And the reason that that difference occurs is because we shouldn't be thinking about these strands as being infinitely thin. We should be think of them as being thick ribbons. So let me extend this thing into a ribbon like this, or a hose, something like that, a big thick hose, and extend this thing into a thick hose. And if you try to straighten this thing out, just pull it tight, you realize that if you ever tried to pull a garden hose tight, you get this. And if, you, if you've never tried to pull a garden hose tight, you're not paying enough attention to your garden. But um, the, the point is that this thing is equivalent to this twisted line, and this is a straight line. So this factor of minus a cubed is in fact making up uh, for the fact that th there's a twist here. And this factor of minus a cubed is actually something we should expect um, because in quantum mechanics, if you take a particle and you twist it around its own axis, it always picks up a phase. And if you recall back up here, that A is actually just a, a modulus one complex number. 
So this minus a cubed is just a phase. So it's representing the this, this spin, if you like, of this particle rotating it around its own axis. It, it picks up a, a complex phase. Um, the, okay, so that's what this is. What this is. Uh, so, so when you go home tonight and you try to calculate the Kaufman invariant of your fam favorite knot, you won't be disturbed that, that this picture and this picture don't give you the same result. Okay, so let me just mention a couple of uh, more of the, of the interesting properties of these topological quantum field theories. Probably the most interesting, most important uh, property is the following. That let me, let me draw, here's my two-dimensional system again, and let's imagine that we put in it uh, a particle, a hole, a particle, and a hole like this. So two particles, two holes. I should make a couple copies of this picture. Uh, copy, uh, paste, I'm gonna paste again here, paste. I'm gonna need use, use this a couple times, so I'm making a couple copies of it. Okay, so in most physical systems, if I tell you I start in the ground state of the system, uh, featureless gapped ground state, and then I add to the system a particle and a hole, a particle and a hole, just you know, two creation operators, two annihilation operators, I've then told you what the wave function of the system is. I've given you the physical wave function by saying here I start with a ground state ket, and then I apply to it some creation operators and some annihilation operators. But in topological quantum field theories, that's not the case. You can have, oops, you can have two linearly independent wave functions, which I'll call one and two, um, which look exactly identical locally, that they have all this, you, know, you start with the ground state and they have uh, quasi particles and quasi holes at exactly the same points. Everything you measure locally looks exactly the same. And yet they're, or they're um, linearly independent or they can even be uh, orthogonal uh, uh, wave functions. Why is that? Well, the reason is we have to think about space-time history a little bit, that these particles could have been pulled apart from each other. The particles in the hole can be pulled apart from each other either in this way, or they could have been pulled apart from each other in this way. And these are topologically distinct. They're different um, space-time histories, and therefore they can be different kets because they will form different knots. To prove to you that these are different kets, what I should do is I should take their inner product with each other. So let's do that. So what I need to do is I need to make the corresponding bras, which you do by basically time reversing everything. That um, time reversal is anti-unitary. Um, or time reversal corresponds to um, flipping over a bra to a, to a ket. Now, in order to take an inner product, all I do is I squeeze these two together like a sandwich to make a closed picture. So for example, let me make this a little smaller so you can see everything at the same time. So, um, oops, go, okay, it's not gonna let me paste. Um, let me draw the picture again. Um, yeah, oh, it will let me paste. Okay, there we go. Here's the picture again. Let's try to calculate uh, one, one like this. So to draw one, one, I squeeze together the one uh, bra with the one ket. So this thing will then look like uh, one going down and one going up. And this picture is just two loops, so it's d squared, okay? I can do the same thing with two and two. I'll do this quickly, two and two, like this. Um, just draw it quickly, faster. Uh, so it looks like this on the top, it looks like this on the bottom. This is two loops again, and that's d squared. However, if I take one on the top and two on the bottom, it will look like this on the top. It will look like this on the bottom, and this, is actually topologically a single loop, D. So if you have two cats whose inner products with themselves is D squared, and actually they're not normalized properly, but okay, we'll deal with that. They're, um, both of them have uh, inner product with themselves D squared, but their inner product with each other is just D, then you know that these are linearly independent uh, cats, linearly independent, linearly independent uh, wave functions. Unless D happens to have magnitude one, which is exactly what happens in the case of, uh, if you want to check, in the case of SU2 level one, you'll discover plugging in A, calculating D, you'll discover that D is actually one. And in that case, um, there's only one linearly independent wave function. But in most cases where D is not equal to one, um, so SU2 level two, SU2 level three, all of these cases, uh, you have two linearly independent wave functions. Now, 
Um, why is that interesting? Well, uh, I very cleverly call these things uh, one and two, um, but if I had instead called them uh, zero and one, uh, you would have thought of a qubit. And that's why uh, people are rather interested in um, this type of physics, because this actually turns out to be a very nice way to make uh, a qubit and do uh, some sort of quantum computation. So let me... Um, uh, they are not orthogonal. They are not orthogonal, but you can orthogonalize them. These are actually not, they're not orthonormal, um, but you can certainly ortho or orthogonalize them and you can construct from one and two uh, an, or an orthonormal set if you want. So that's, I, I guess maybe that's a good reason why I didn't call them zero and one, because it would be misrepresenting them as being, as being, um, as being orthogonal when they're not. So yeah, so maybe that's a, that's a, that's a good answer. True. Um, good. Um, so the idea of using this sort of braiding physics for quantum computation is known as topological quantum computation. Um, and it's generally computation. It's generally credited to two people, uh, Alexei Kateyev, uh, one of the great geniuses of, of our modern era from whom lots of very interesting ideas have come, and Michael Friedman, um, uh, also a fields medalist for his work on, um, on the Poincaré conjecture way back in the 19, 1980s. So the general idea works like this. Um, you imagine a two-dimensional system and we had a situation where we created um, two particles and two holes and that constituted a single two-state system. So if I do that, so time again running vertical, T like this, uh, there I've created a qubit. Here I create another qubit, here's another qubit, here's another qubit like this. In order to do operations on these qubits, I just braid these particles around each other in some ways. So let me draw braids rather rapidly and messily. So they do some, some complicated braids. Um, and we, we spent quite a lot of time uh, determining which braids you should do in order to do certain uh, computations. And then at the end of the day, you make measurements. Here, here. By bringing the particles back together in pairs, and some of them will reannihilate to the vacuum, re-emitting uh, the energy that you put in, and others of them will um, form bound states, which do not re-emit to the vacuum. And this is your measurement at the end of the day. Um, so I have to prove to you uh, in the last five minutes uh, two things. Uh, the first thing I should prove to you is first that you can do computation this way, um, and secondly that you would want to do so. So let's start with the first, that you can do quantum computation this way. If you think back to the beginning of the talk, we discovered that um, do, calculating the Kaufman invariant of a complicated knot was exponentially hard, that even in a thousand years, you could never calculate the Kaufman invariant of a knot with a hundred crossings. However, suppose you had one of these topological quantum field theories in your laboratory, you could just drag the particles around each other to form the particular knot that you're interested in, and then the probability of all of them reannihilating is exactly the Kalfman invariant squared. So by doing the experiment many, many times, you can get a very good estimate of the Kalfman invariant of a very, very complicated knot, which is something that a uh, classical computer is not able to do. So this tells us for sure that um, this topological computer can compute Kalfman, oops, let me draw that in white, uh, can compute Kalfman uh, efficiently efficiently, which is something a classical computer cannot do. Now it turns out with a little bit more work, you can convince yourself that this topological quantum computer can do uh, computations that um, any quantum computer can do. They're equivalent uh, as far as uh, computational ability is, uh, is concerned. The second question um, I should answer is why would you want to do uh, quantum computation this way? If you back up all the way to uh, this list of, of different phases of matter, as, as I mentioned, the, the evidence that these things even have these braiding properties is extremely weak. So why would you go to all the work of trying to uh, engineer, you know, these Majorana systems or the fractional quantum Hall systems, which are very poorly understood and um, very hard to work with when people have other approaches for doing quantum computation? Well, the reason why people are interested in this is, is the following. Um, we need to think about why it is that quantum computation is, is hard 
in, in the first place. The reason it's hard is because, um, because of noise and, and, and coupling to the environment, uh, decoherence, basically. If you have, if you have you know, the conventional picture of a uh, quantum computer is you know, a bunch of you know, spins or two-state systems that are, you, know, you have in traps, and you form some really complicated entangled state and sitting there, and while you're doing some computation, some noise shows up, and if that noise shows up, it can create an error in your computation, and that causes problems, and you have to go to great lengths to do error protection. Now, let's think about what happens if noise shows up in this uh, experiment here. What's the noise going to do? Say it's a photon or a phonon or something like that. Well, what it can do is it instead of uh, this particular particle taking a straight path, it will shake this particle around. And now the particle has to take uh, a wiggly path because it's been hit by the noise. Uh, however, as long as the path has the same topology as your intended path, then it hasn't made an error at all. You have done exactly the same computation um, without, without introducing any errors. So the point is that these topological quantum computers are inherently noise protected. So they're immune to small air, to immune to small noise. Small noise. Um, and that's the reason people are, are interested in pursuing this uh, approach for quantum computation. So um, it is a bit of a dark horse candidate for, uh, for quantum computation, but, um, but company Microsoft for one is investing a lot of eggs in that, in that basket. Um, if I have maybe just a few minutes left to run over, um, or maybe, maybe I should, I, I could stop there. Um, the last thing that I was going to say is I'm going to say just a couple words about uh, what is fractional quantum Hall effect and why is it we think it's a topological quantum field theory. But maybe it's it's better to end on time and, and take questions rather than go off on a on a final tangent. Uh, anyway, Please. so I'll, thank you. For your, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Questions. I'm happy if you can if you want to continue. I, I don't uh, guarantee that. Uh, you know, we'll maintain all participants, but if you want to. Uh, okay. Well, I mean, if, okay, let me, let me, I'll, I'll take less than five minutes to, to just um, say just a couple words about fractional quantum Hall effect. The reason um, that uh, it's worth talking about fractional quantum Hall effect is because that's the, the premier example we have of topologically ordered matter of, of when we really know that we have a topological quantum field theory. So what is fractional quantum Hall effect? It's, it's, it's basically, I hope there are no experimentalists in the audience because they'll probably strangle me if I tell you it's this simple, but it's uh, two dimensional electrons in a magnetic field and you cool it down to low temperature, cool it down to low temperature and out comes fractional quantum Hall effect. It's, it's, it's that simple. And depending on the you know, ratio of the density of particles to the magnetic field made dimensionless by a flux quantum, this, this number can be something like, you know, it can be five halves or 12 fifths or, or one third or, or some other numbers like this, you get a different phase of matter. And we believe that all of these phases of matter that you get out of fractional quantum Hall effect are, um, are topological quantum field theories or TQFTs. Um, now, just one comment, um, sort of a general comment that if you're from a high energy background, uh, you have in your head this paradigm of, of spontaneous symmetry breaking that, that at very high energies, there's this very symmetric theory of the universe. And when you cool it down, uh, symmetry breaks and you have a less symmetric theory at, at low temperature. And in fact, in a lot of condensed matter, you have, you have similar physics where symmetry breaks as you cool down. But in fact, you have exactly the opposite in this case. What you have is symmetry emergence that the low temperature theory has a huge symmetry group because it, it has a symmetry under deformations of space and time. You can deform knots any way you want and the end results stay the same. The low energy theory has the symmetry, whereas the high energy theory doesn't have the symmetry. Um, so it's a little bit backwards from our, our conventional uh, picture of, of how symmetries operate. Now, the last thing um, I wanna say is how is it we know that uh, these fractional quantum Hall systems are a topological quantum field theories? Well, there aren't that ex many experiments that you can do easily. The one experiment you can do easily is a very simple experiment where you take your two-dimensional system, it can have any shape you like, um, and you attach electrical contacts to it, this. And then you run current through um, between two of them and you measure voltage between the other two. So if you do the experiment like I've drawn here, um, you will measure voltage equals zero. This is longitudinal voltage equals zero. And that tells you that you have a dissipationless state like a, like a superfluid. 
Um, however, you can change the experiment a little bit by topologically crossing the leads. So you can make this lead go like this, and this one goes under, and then connect like this. So we have cross leads. And if you do the experiment this way, the voltage you measure is uh, h over e squared, and then the ratio of small integers times um, times the current that you, you that you flow. And this uh, result comes out precise to one part in one part in ten to the ten. In well, let me just say, yeah, one part in ten to the ten, or better. Um, basically, as precisely as you can as you can measure it. It's extremely well protected. Um, extremely precise result. And this is independent of the shape of the sample or how you attach your contacts to the edge uh, of the sample. And if you compare this kind of experiment to measuring, say, the resistance of a piece of copper, the resistance of the piece of copper changes completely if you change where you put the, uh, put the contacts or you change how you attach the contacts or you change the shape of, of the sample. But in, in this experiment, it doesn't matter at all. And this one part in 10 to the 10, that's like measuring the distance from Oxford to Tel Aviv or to Technion to Haifa in to, to a millimeter or better. So it's incredibly high precision. Now, a question people always ask is, well, what are these particles that you want to drag around each other? And it's, it's pretty easy to imagine what they are. This is uh, some sort of dissipationless fluid we have in here, this fractional quantum Hall fluid. And the fractional quantum Hall fluid, because it's dissipationless, it has um, vortices in it, which are persistent, that last for all time. So you'll have a vortex and maybe an anti-vortex. These are charged quasi-particles in another language, like this. Um, and it's in fact, these vortices that you want to drag around each other. These are the quasi-particles, the particles that have the interesting uh, braiding statistics. Now, if you think back for a second, all the way to Lord Kelvin, Lord Kelvin was thinking about a, um, braiding vortices around in a dissipationless fluid, but his, his vortices were one-dimensional lines. Here we have almost exactly the same thing. We have point vortices and we braid them around to make two plus one-dimensional world lines. We get knots in our two plus one-dimensional world lines as compared to our knots in our three you know, one-dimensional lines. So, so Kelvin was thinking about a three-dimensional system with lines in it that not, and here we're thinking about two plus one dimensional system with space-time world lines that not. So it's actually it's actually quite quite similar in, in spirit to what uh, Kelvin was thinking about 150 years ago, but in obviously a completely different context. So I guess I will uh, stop there and take any any further questions. Uh, can I ask a question? Thank you, Steve. Because sure. I I, uh, I have to leave soon, sorry. So uh, thank you, it was a brilliant talk. Thank you. Uh, so uh, what is the, the recent evidence for fractional statistics? You mentioned it. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, there are two experiments. We actually, there's a, I, can, I can send you, send me an email, I'll send you a link. There, there was a conference that was held uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, where the two experiments, it was basically, a, a, it was a chance to stress test these two experiments. One of them is, is an interferometer experiment, Fabi Pro interferometer. Um, and as you, you probably know from the history of the field, that there have been attempts to do Fabi Pro interferometry in fractional quantum Hall effect uh, for about 15 years or, or longer now. Probably and, longer, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's been very problematic. But there's finally been a successful experiment doing this uh, by Mike Manfred's group at Purdue. And the trick to doing it was uh, screening the Coulomb interaction by growing a second um, or two um, electron gases next to the electron gas you're studying that kills the charging energy and makes it, and everything, at least for nucleus one third, everything comes out absolutely beautifully. So it really is, is, uh, is, is fantastic now. A very direct measurement of fractional statistics as far as I can tell. Um, the other experiment was an experiment done in France um, with this, this is what they call the anion collider experiment, which is, it's, uh, you, you know that the, there's been this, these attempts to do sort of Hanbury brown twist type correlations for a, a very long time. And um, it was basically just figuring out what's the right geometry for doing this. 
Um, and so eventually they did the right geometry and, and, and the data there also looks extremely good, very convincing. So um, it's less direct measurement of statistics as, as in a braiding sense. It's more of a, uh, it more tells you about the Green's function of the, along the edge then it tells you about the braiding statistics, but those are obviously intimately connected. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Is there, were there other questions? Uh, uh, yeah, so, so thank, thanks also for me for a great talk. I, I, you, you kind of convinced us that, you know, this platform is so great for quantum computing. So I'm interested in your view of, of you know, so, so if everything is so good, why are we not there yet? And whether it is only a matter of time or there <laughs> yeah. are some fundamental... So, okay, uh, you let, know, let, me, let, me be, let me be honest about it. Um, I don't, even despite the, the recent um, advances in fractional quantum Hall effect, I don't think anyone's actually going to build a quantum computer out of fractional quantum Hall effect. Um, it's just too messy, at least not in, in gallium arsenide. And I don't know, maybe graphene will turn out to be a little bit easier to manipulate or something like that. Maybe someone will come up with something completely different where all the problems go away. But it's, it's just too inconvenient a system to work with. I mean, it took 35 years to just do a simple braiding of, of, of two particles around each other and measure the, the interference phase that you, that you get out of, out of this. And that, so, and, and it was not for lack of trying. There were many experimental groups that gave this an attempt. You know, Modi Heidblum is one of them who spent a lot of time um, trying to do this. Um, so fractional quantum Hall effect is not really a um, ideal system for doing this. Now there's, um, there's a number of, of uh, very well-funded uh, attempts to do Majorana experiments, uh, often in, in one-dimensional wires, but also in um, semiconductor heterostructures, um, where people felt like, well, fractional quantum Hall effect is very difficult. Why don't we try something that, that's based on superconductivity that should be a little bit easier, um, uh, easier going? And they started work on these Majoranas, and then there was a lot of excite excitement about the first quote observation of Majoranas, and then things stalled in that too. And it turns out that these things, that uh, these Majorana experiments, are not as clear as as you would want them to be either. That 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 the initial experiments that tells you you have Majoranas, uh, it, it does the right thing, but no one's been able to do a braiding experiment. No one's been able to build a qubit out of it. So that's also been a little bit upsetting. Although those are, those are really, they're putting a lot of, of money into the Majoranas. It's on the order of, of $100 million a year investment into, into doing this. Um, now that's a lot less than the amount of investment going into the you know, conventional transbond qubits and the ion trapping qubits and so forth, but it's significant. Um, now, my feeling, to be honest, if I had to bet, I would bet against these. However, it doesn't make me completely despair for the following reason. Um, suppose the people making transmon qubits or ion trap qubits, these people are victorious and they managed to build a 100 qubit computer 200 qubit computer or something like that. And they can actually do real computations on it. And then they want to scale it up. Well, they're going to need error correction for their, their computer. It turns out that the best error correction known is known as the surface code or the toric code, another language. And that is an anion system or a topological quantum field theory. So the study of topological quantum field theories in a different context of error correction is still very exciting, even if, um, even if these other approaches to quantum computing Turns out to be the the winner. If you know, if I had to, if I had to bet, I would actually bet against someone building a uh, Majorana quantum computer. Although you know, the people who are doing the Majoranas, they have very good reasons why some of the other the other approaches are actually going to run into trouble, and they may be right. Um, but I I see the Majorana approaches also having trouble these days. Um, so I mean, everyone has their their difficulties. Uh, I think at the very least, it's very likely. That, uh, that the topological way of thinking, the topological ideas will be reincarnated in the context of error correcting codes, which will be necessary for running any real uh, calculation. Thank you. Uh, uh, I have a question. Yes. Um, in your argument that you uh, are moving around these uh, quasi particles, you're assuming that there's a gap, right? That you are protected yes. from dissipation, but there's always edges in quantum Hall, and those are gapless, and there's also leads. 
Yes. Is that a problem or that's been shown not to be? No, I'm, well, okay, I'm not sure anyone's uh, considered that in detail. I don't think it's a problem. Um, the, you know, the question is whether you can uh, move things around in the bulk without, uh, you know, creating, you know, entangling yourself with the excitations on the edge. Obviously, anything with that entangles the topological degrees of freedom in the bulk with the edge would be problematic. You might say, well, you know, how are you going to move something in the bulk without having some influence on the edge? But I think the, the point here is that there's sort of a topological sector and there's a non-topological sector. And, you know, there's sort of a U1 sector that you just don't care about. And it's very easy to entangle things with the U1 sector, the, you know, um, the usual overall phase of the wave function with the edge. But, but that's not where you're putting all the interesting quantum information. That, that everything else is, is stored in the non-abelian sectors. And those are very robust and won't entangle with the edges easily, unless, unless you can tunnel to the edge. If you can tunnel to the edge, they can get entangled and they cause trouble. But if you keep yourself you know, more than a uh, tunneling distance from the, from the edge, then you'll be in, in, in good business, I think. OK, thanks. You're welcome. I have a question too. So uh, in the standard model of uh, computation, say in the circuit model, at the end of the day, you want to measure in the computational basis qubits. Yeah. How can you, how do you relate this to measure, to transport measurement in the fractional quad or in, in to, to, to transport me measurements in general? Yeah, so, okay. Um, this, is, this is the question of how do you, how do you build and measure a qubit out of, um, you know, in, in quantum hall or in some other um, topological yes. system. Mm -hmm. So there's, a, there's sort of an in-principle question and an in-practice in question. Um, the in-principle question is you have two, quasi, two of these particles and you bring them together and you need to know the fusion channel. Is it fusing to one type of product say the vacuum or another type of pro product, say a, a bound state. The energies of those are different, okay? So as you bring them together, when they get within some you know, microscopic length, their energies will change. And all you have to do is measure the energy or the force on the particles or something like that. So in principle, there's a very simple way to do it. In practice, that's an extremely hard thing to do, but because these things are very small, they have very, very strong, small forces on them and there's lots of noise and blah, blah, blah. But in principle, it's very clear how, you know, that. If the particles are in the, you know, the zero state of the qubit, you bring them together and, and the energy goes down, whereas if you bring them in the one state of the qubit, the energy goes up. And, and that, would, you know, that kind of thing should be easily measurable. Now, how do you actually measure that in a transport experiment uh, is, is another story. You could try to do an interference experiment uh, around, uh, so you can try to do an interference experiment around a qubit. If everything was perfectly calibrated and the only difference between the two experiments is either the qubit is in a zero state or one state, then the inter you know, if you do an interference experiment that goes around that qubit, you will see either constructive or destructive interference. But of course, you have to make sure that absolutely nothing else changed, just the state of the qubit, and you know, that nothing else can muck up your, your interference signal. But in principle, that's another way to measure it, which is also possible. So I think in practice, it's something that's, you know, it's incredibly hard because we haven't even built a single qubit and measured it. So no one knows how you'd actually do it, but at least as a, a question of, of principle, it's, it's, there's many straightforward ways to, to try. Thank you. Welcome. I have also the question if it's possible. Sure. Sure, go ahead. Uh, could, could you elaborate more about the S23 uh, Fibonacci anions? What is the best results? You told us there is no uh, experimental evidence, but uh, numerical. And yeah, if it that's... was anyway, some attempts. Uh, to yeah, do this. so there's, there's an, a number of, of numerical works. Um, I think the, the first one that, that came up with really convincing evidence that the new equals 12 fifth state um, in gallium arsenide is this of SU2 level three class or the, the so-called reed uh Z3 uh, wave function. Um, was worked by Reed and Rezai, I think, in the early 2000s. But uh, more recently, people have been able to use DMRG approaches. Um, and, and there was a big collaboration. I think it may have also included Ed Rezai, but Mike Zalatel and Roger Mong. And, and they threw an awful lot of computational power at it. And they came to the same conclusion 
that new equals 12 fifth is, is of, of the re, in reader's eye class. Um, now, uh, you know, obviously this is not, um, this is not experimental evidence. This is, you know, numerical theoretical evidence, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it seems pretty convincing from a, a numerical stand. I mean, the, the history of numerics in quantum Hall effect is extremely good that um, in compared to numerics in, in other systems. Um, you know, that it's because of the reduced Hilbert space, it tends to be extremely accurate. So I think it's, it's something that we can probably trust. Other questions? There are more questions? Uh, I want to say again, it was a wonderful talk. Yeah, it was really, thank you. Thank you. Thank really, you really clear. Absolutely yeah, good. fantastic. Good. Glad, um, glad you enjoyed it. And someday I will come down there and visit you guys in person, but I just don't know when. Okay. Actually, we did I, giggle I, with yeah. the jokes, but uh, I'm sorry we did, you didn't hear that. Oh, okay, <laughs> all right, all right. For those who are interested, Steve, I think we scheduled another condensed matter seminar. In, in, oh, that's right, yeah, in like in about a month, month or now. something, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah so, so I'll, I'll be back, yeah. Yeah, for the so. aficionados. Okay. Good. All right. Thank you very much, Steve. It was a great talk. All right, really take care. Have a, have a good day and, and keep safe, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.